It's a great pleasure to speak with you today. Uh, yes, my name is Rich Wolski, and I'm a professor here at UCSB. I'm also the Chief Technology Officer uh, at uh, Eucalyptus Systems. And I thought what I would do today is talk a little bit about uh, a revolution that's really taking place in large-scale systems. I've done distributed systems research for many years, and it's been largely interesting to me and boring for everybody else until recently. Um, and so, uh, so I thought I'd share some of that excitement with you. Um, it, there's an apocryphal story that's been attributed to the founders of Google, and I hope it's true because hyperbole is something we don't have enough of these days. But uh, it, it is that the, 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 in an interview, one of the founders claimed that the goal of Google was to become the mind of God. Uh, that, we think, is a data center that Google has recently built on the Columbia Gorge. They're not very clear about uh, that, or, and, and everybody else has been sworn to secrecy. But if that's the mind of God, it's a lot smaller than I thought it was going to be. Right? And in Google's defense, they're going to build 25 of these things. But still, 25 data centers of that size is not really uh, as big as, as the Bible would say. Uh, we would expect uh, all human knowledge and, 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 and omnipresence and so on and so forth to be. And so clearly the world's getting smaller. Um, now, uh, uh, less uh, perhaps flippantly, uh, what's happened here is that Google and, and internet search represents a quantum leap in human cognition capability. Uh, uh, Douglas Riskoff, who's a, a futurist and a technology writer, pointed out that, in fact, what's happened is internet search has done to writing what writing did to oral history 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, there were these long poems that people had to memorize, and, uh, and we, you know, we paid people or compensated them in some way to recite them for us. That skill is gone. Human beings do fine without it. Writing made it obsolete. Well, writing's on its way out, we think, and we think it's because search has made the need for writing things down uh, much, or at least search has improved the process of remembering things that we would write down normally, right? So what's happened here is really we're using very large scale systems to improve our memories. We can remember a lot more stuff in a much smaller space as a result of internet search. What's next? What other human cognition capabilities are large scale systems going to make better? And here's my assertion. My assertion is that there are two more that you're going to see in the immediate future. One is inference, and the other one is prediction. Deborah Estrin talked about inference, but she didn't give it a definition. We'll try to do that here in a minute. So what we're really going to look at is how memory, inference, and prediction make the world smaller because we can do them with very large scale systems. All right, what is inference? Inference is the notion that we can make a perceptive either decision or, or um, observation based on reasoning rather than direct observation. Right? This is kind of a, a, a product of modern civilization. Uh, you know, it used to be you would either see the fire or not see the fire. Now we can look at all sorts of signs and infer whether there is fire someplace. And so uh, uh, that notion of using um, uh, uh, your mind or reasoning capabilities and lots of perhaps conflicting facts to make a conclusion is the process of inference. And, and the thing to keep in mind with respect to search is you can get lots of information from search, Pulling meaning out of that information is the inference part, and we don't have a lot of good computational tools for doing that. Large-scale systems, though, can be employed in that uh, process. So uh, uh, Deborah Estrin and David Culler are, are progenitors, they're geniuses, and they're progenitors of this notion uh, of, of instrumenting the world. It's called sensor network research. I've done some of this research myself. And, and, and when I was working on it, I came up with this thought problem, right? This thought experiment. And I call it the running with scissors problem, right? So let's imagine in the future that it's not just cell phones that have GPSs, it's everything. It's your, your Coke cans and your pets and, uh, and your automobiles. And, and these GPS sensors are telling you more than where they are. They're telling you the temperature, they're telling you their orientation, they're giving you environmental information. We're sensing the world, right? Okay, if everything has a sensor, can I determine immediately whether my toddler is running with scissors? Okay, so here's a toddler, and the toddler has a sensor. It's either been uh, ingested or, uh, or, put, or somehow <laughs> attached to the toddler. Um, uh, lots of parents, I suspect, uh, are looking forward to this future. Um, uh, and then there are some scissors, and they've got a sensor on it. And these sensors are telling something, not you, a computer that you own or that you have a piece of, something about the scissors and the toddler constantly, constantly. Now, to figure out whether the toddler is running with scissors is actually kind of a trick, right? I mean, you can't just look at uh, the scissors and the toddler's speed. 
That's not going to do it, right? The scissors and the toddler not, might not be co-located. OK, they've got to be in the same place. How fast are they moving? If you're carrying the toddler and the scissors, that's not running with scissors. If the toddler and the scissors are in a car, that's not running with scissors. Are the scissors in a backpack? Oh, that may or may not be running with scissors, so on and so forth. So really, it's just not as simple as this picture looks. Furthermore, it's not a problem that uh, lends itself well to search, in the sense that the computer constantly has to monitor the toddler and the scissors all the time. It's not like, it's like having a constant update for every web page in the universe all the time. This is a quantum leap in computational requirement um, uh, to solve this kind of problem. And you don't want to solve it only for your toddler and your sizzlers, of which there are millions. You want to do it for your smoke detectors and your cell phones and your household appliances. Imagine a refrigerator, for example, that's got RFID, and Walmart is tagging everything with RFID. If you don't know what RFID is, it's like these little passive sensors. They're very cheap. Your refrigerator now can know when you take food out, when you put food in, what food is there. If it goes to the internet and gets a calorie count, it can tell you something about your diet, right? This is coming. And it requires a lot more computational power than just internet search. Right? And we're already seeing companies trying to do this. There's this thing called opinion mining. I find this fascinating. There are companies that scrape, uh, basically pull the data off automatically, YouTube and MySpace and Twitter and the blogosphere and so on and so forth, and they read the words. They're actually processing the text, and they try to furnish you with an estimate of what the opinion is of you or your brand or something like that. That's an inference problem. There's no direct observation. They are reading information that's obviously contradictory and of varying qualities, and they're making a statement about reality. Turns out, though, that inference is not really what you want. <laughs> inference is good, but what everybody really wants is a prediction. And why is this? Well, you have senses, and inference conflicts with your senses often. You may observe something, but your reasoning tells you something else. We have no predictive sense for the future. We only can infer what's going to happen into the future. So we use a lot of inference as prediction. It actually turns out that it's not quite the same. In the running with scissors problem, the prediction that you're really looking for is, will my child be injured? You don't really, you're, you're going to make a prediction about the possibility of injury based on whether uh, the state of the world is that they're running with scissors. But in point of fact, the ultimate goal, the holy grail, is to be able to predict what's going to happen should that state of the world exist at this moment. And, and we see this all the time, right? What kind of car should I buy? I have a friend who just bought a car. And uh, rather than uh, talking to our, our uh, CFO, who is an expert on automobiles, he, he said, no, 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 I'm just going to go on the internet and read everything there is about all the cars that I'm interested in and make a decision. That's an inference, right? And a prediction. You look at the state of the world now, and then we just assume that that state of the world is going to persist, and it becomes a prediction. Will I like this movie? I worked on a problem called the Netflix Prize, where they have a recommendation system which says, what movies do you like? OK, here's the movie you will like. That's a prediction. Who should I date? Right? You see these things on TV where they say, oh, there's 27 different you know, versions of, of uh, your emotional state, and we're going to match you with someone. That's a prediction problem. And it's even more compute intensive than inference. Why? Because first you have to know what the state of the world is, and then you have to be able to build some model that takes you from the state of the world to some new state in the future. So what does this have to do with cloud computing? Well, where is all that compute power going to come from? It's going to come from something we call the cloud. And the reason we call it the cloud is because we think of network power today as coming from this opaque, ubiquitous, unseen cloud, right? When you draw a picture of a network or an, or an internet-enabled thing, you usually just draw the network as a cloud. And, and really, if you think about it, that's how you perceive the network today. When you fire up your wireless, there's a lot of machines and a lot of software uh, and, and hardware that's invoked automatically. And you don't really know what those machines are doing, when were they last upgraded, that's, that's new, right? When I started in computers, networks were not opaque. You needed to know everything about every bit that was being transferred. That's gone. It's all appliance-sized. The next step is to do for networking uh, what we've done to computing, which is to say there's just this compute power that's available out there on demand when you want it uh, to, to exploit 
for these kinds of problems. And Google and Facebook and MySpace and YouTube, these are all really early forms of this. You don't know what the infrastructure is doing, you just know what they do. So the real uh, punchline here is when we start making inferences, as Deborah was saying, about our world, we're gonna need a personal cloud. We're gonna need to be able to store, search, and compute over lots and lots of data very, very quickly. And we at Eucalyptus Systems, as a product of the research group that uh, you know, came with me to commercialize our early technology, build this kind of stuff. So in summary, um, uh, this is now, and that's Google's data center. And if we move uh, forward in time, the next step I predict will be inference, and we're gonna need some more compute power. And, and then following that, once we've got a good handle on how to do inference, we'll really start doing prediction, which is gonna require even more computing power, and cloud computing is the new paradigm that's gonna make all of this possible. I'll conclude by saying thanks to everybody who has made this talk possible, the University of California, Santa Barbara. This is the most underrated computer science university in the country. I'm a little biased, but it's true. Um, uh, the research that made Eucalyptus possible was sponsored by the National Science Foundation, VGRADS, which is a, a research project that they uh, funded. And we have some new funding agents who are uh, enthusiastic and wonderful to work for as well. Uh, my name is Rich, that's my email, and thank you very much for listening to me today.